today I'm just going to talk about a few comics. First, we're going to look at something I got for free at the comic book store today. Transformers Revenge of the Fallen. Now, if any of you haven't gone to see this movie yet, you need to run out and go as far away from this film as possible. It's a horrible, terrible mess of a movie to watch. The two scenes of dogs fucking. Why did they need two scenes of that? At least they showed some decorum in the comic and they left that out. But they did bring in a little more racism. Here's one of the lines from uh, one of the box. I can't even tell what the box is. I'm going to take a look at some of it. Uh, one of them says... If that happens, the toxic spill cover story the Chinese government cooked up will be well and truly chop suey. Well, that's good. They racist and poor writing at the same time. For the most part, the whole thing is just a piece of shit just like the movie. It follows the basic premise of the first ten minutes or so. But, for those people lucky enough to get this, it comes with Kmart coupons. And they're Kmart coupons that expired in September, in uh, July of '09. So at least uh, this is a total loss. If you want to keep consistent with that kind of thing. Now, first I'm going to have to bring up the elephant in the room: Batman and Robin number sixteen. Overall, I enjoyed the main part of the story. It was a good ending to the story they were running. But, of course, the big ending is the point of contention. At the end, Bruce Wayne announces to the world that he is that he has been financing Batman for all these years. Fabulous. Now, first, let me get into the things I don't like about it. Firstly, there's the abruptness. The story ends, everybody's recuperating, they're all calming down. And then all of a sudden Batman says, get ready to meet the public. And there's all of a sudden a big press conference and he makes this big announcement out of nowhere. There's no build up or anything. Which brings me to the writer who did this. Grant Morrison. Now, I want to say I've hated Grant Morrison forever. He's done a lot of things that I've actually really enjoyed. Um, he, his, Hell, his Hellblazer 25 and 26. His run on Invisibles. Uh, some Janet Lay books. Batman Arkham Asylum. The Filth. Uh, but then he went and he raped the X-Men. As a big X-Men fan, I don't really like to discuss that era of the stories. But uh, it was, needless to say, it was very bad. <sighs> Gay biker Wolverine. <sighs> Professor X has killed his twin sister in the womb. Morrison did that. Anyway, uh, he continues his trend of bad writing here in Batman with this sudden announcement that, first of all, I'm sure he thinks is this great new idea, this brilliant change he's doing to Batman, something that Iron Man did almost 50 years ago. Now, I will say, I have one point that I do actually like about this idea. Bruce Wayne is fucked in the head. He's just as messed up as most of his rogues gallery. His parents were killed, destroyed his mind, and he's been running around obsessed trying to fight crime. It lead, I think it's uh, a logical step in his psychosis, as no one has ever bothered to help him with it, they've just been feeding it. By letting him fight crime, they've been feeding into this psychosis of his. And it's just gotten worse and worse and worse. So I think it's the logical step would be one day Bruce Wayne's going to wake up and go, I'm going to fucking save the world. I'm going to just get everybody together and we're going to fight crime everywhere. I see him doing that. That's the one thing I do like about it, but with Grant Morrison still working on the Batman books, I don't have a lot of hope for what's coming. I would say, I would recommend buying this. I do like the main part of the story. Plus, it's going to be a big uh, controversial issue you might want to have. Next, 
I'm going to talk about Generation Hope. I won't get into too much of the backstory, so I'll just give you a brief. Hope is the first mutant born after M Day when Wanda Maximoff, the Scarlet Witch, and decided that we said that there's no more mutants, there are no more mutants being born, and there's only a handful of them left. And she was the first one to happen after be born after that. Everybody, the Purifiers, Mr. Sinister, the X-Men, everybody wanted to get her. Cable got her, took her into the future to hide her. Bishop started chasing her around time. That whole thing was actually a pretty good story. I actually liked the whole Cable raising hope storyline. Eventually, she got back. Now, here she is in the present time, running around with Rogue, uh, looking for new mutants who were also showing up all of a sudden. There's more mutants popping up around the world. Our first issue has her already with a few new mutants. We've got one girl who seems to be able to control fire and ice. Uh, some blue chick who can turn her skin to crystal. Uh, another dude, some guy who can run really fast. That's new. And another guy who's basically just Beast from the 1963 version of the X-Men, but without the intellect. In fact, he pisses on someone at one point in the first issue, so it's got that going for it. First issue has them going to Japan to find another new mutant, who well, I'll save for a little later. That's, that surprise will come in a second. So they go with Rogue, and they're going to meet up with Cyclops and Wolverine. Something crazy's going on, though. This new mutant's not handling his powers too well. So, being that we're in Japan, of course, this new mutant is... A Tentacle Monster! Not only is it a Tentacle Monster, but it is a Tentacle Monster that has already got itself a Japanese schoolgirl. While the X-Men are all down there freaking out, the Japanese people are just going, again? They're, they're used to that kind of thing over there. Anyway, so they go, they try to fight it, and nothing's happening. Rogue tells the kids they gotta go hide, as she always does. But, not listening, Hope decides she's her power, she's gonna touch it, and it's gonna get under control, it'll be okay. She goes in, inside the house where he's staying. And he's retracted back into himself until she gets there and she goes to touch him when suddenly... Kaneda! We get ourselves a little homage to uh, Akira here. A big homage to Akira that in fact even has the same ending as Akira. So honestly, I cannot recommend this issue. It wasn't very good. It was quite a bit silly. It's kind of fun if you just want to throw your money away on something new. But I'll probably hang in for a couple issues, not staying in for the long haul. It doesn't seem like it's going to be very interesting. Oh. Thank you guys again for having me. It was nice talking with you. Cheers, gentlemen, and I hope to be back soon.